gathering together unto Jesus. Praise God, for he deserves our love, our honor, our worship. Praise God. He is the Lord of Lords. He's the King of Kings, and he's coming soon. Hallelujah. To take us home. Praise God. And he is also coming to judge this world. And uh, we need to be ready for the things that are about to take place on the earth. But uh, let's thank God that we belong to him. Praise God, because we've surrendered our hearts to him. But let's do that afresh, shall we, today? Lord, we thank you that you have loved us and you have saved us by your precious blood. And Lord, we gather together to you right now to honor you, to say that you are first in our hearts and our lives because you did not just create us, but you have redeemed us. You have bought us. You have purchased us with your blood and we belong to you. And so here we come, gather together in your name to give you the honor and the praise of our hearts and to invite you to take possession of our souls, that your hand be upon our lives and that we might be your instruments in the earth of, of love and grace and the gospel. Oh God, we thank you that as we gather together in your name, you are here in the midst and you are mighty and you are wonderful through your wonderful Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord, for the destroying every barrier that gets in the way and for bringing us into your holy presence right now. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Good morning, family. Good morning. What a privilege we have to worship God this morning, amen. amen. When we all rise to our feet, turn to your neighbor, give them a big God bless you, say hello to someone new if you God can. Bless you. Yeah. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you as well. Um, God bless you all. God bless you. God bless you too. Do we not have a pianist then today? No, what happened? Is it meant to be the wall? No, we didn't actually have anybody on the Your master's word 
So let my deeds outrun my words. 
set our eyes upon you, O oh God. We declare you are great and greatly to be praised, Father God. So we lift our praise unto you, O oh God. With our hearts, O oh God, we declare you are Lord of all. So we bless your name, Jesus. Because you deserve it all. It's the splendor of a King. Clothed in majesty. Let all the earth rejoice, let all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide. But trembles at his voice, trembles at his voice. How great! Is our God? For your 
God, come on, don't fall silent right now. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. He oh, is a miracle working oh, God. Hallelujah. And there is no one else like our God. There is no one else like Jesus. There is no one else who can do what He is doing in your life. There is no one else who cares for you like Him. No one else, no one else who can supply your needs and meet all of your needs like Him. There is no one else. There is no one else you can turn to in your trouble who can deliver you, who can rescue you, who can supply every answer that you need, who can open every door that's locked and, and remove every obstacle that's in your way. There is no one. There is no one else like our Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Glory to God in the highest. Glory to God in the highest. Glory to Jesus. Yes, Lord, yours is the victory. And because we're in you, ours is the victory. Ours is the victory. Because yours is the victory. And because yours is the victory, mine is the victory. Ours is the victory. Today and every day. Hallelujah. 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 Praise God forevermore. Hallelujah. Amen and amen. Well, God bless you. You may be seated if you can. A warm welcome to all of you and a special welcome to those who are joining us online. It's so good to have you with us at Oxford Bible Church today. We want to give a very special welcome to anyone in the house who is here for the very first time today. We want to give you a, a welcome pack that looks a little bit like this. Our ushers have those ready to hand to you. So if this is your first Sunday service with us this morning and you don't yet have one of these, can you just lift up your hand nice and high please, wherever you might be, so the ushers can find you, just keep your hand up nice and high, there's some hands right there at the back, on the very back row, God bless you, welcome, so glad that you're joining us today, keep your hand up until they reach you, anyone else, nice and high, so they don't miss you out, God bless you, welcome, there's a couple more hands there, just keep it up until they reach you, we're so glad you're joining us Today, inside there is a, a visitor's card. We'd be so grateful if you would uh, fill that out. Uh, let us know if you're looking for a church and you want to know more about OBC. Uh, or maybe you're just visiting. And uh, either way, do fill out that card. And uh, you can hand it to an usher at the end or just drop it into the offering bucket. There is an offering bucket by the door where we receive uh, cash and check physical offerings. So do leave that card with us, either with an usher or in the, uh, in the bucket there by the door. And if you have time after the service, our pastors would love to meet you here at the front. So do come and uh, make yourself known to them. We're so grateful that you're with us today. Praise God. So uh, we have a, perf a special performance, I think, coming up shortly. But before we get to that, uh, let me just say a uh, wonderful praise report you may have seen in the newsletter, of course, uh, just over a week ago. Uh, young Martha Bitha, uh, one of our young people from Junior Church, uh, fell seriously ill and was diagnosed with kidney failure and ended up in Great Ormond Street Children's Hospital in London and uh, needed more than one blood transfusion. And it was a very, very dire situation. But praise God, many in the house were, were, were praying. Many in the family were, were getting up early in the day and different groups were praying and holding her before the Lord. And uh, praise God. She came home on a Friday. I believe it was Thursday or Friday. She came home having made a dramatic U-turn in her condition, a wonderful recovery. Doctors were staggered. Hallelujah. Praise God. 
Hallelujah. We thank God. We thank God. We thank God for an extraordinary, quick, supernatural work of God. Praise the Lord forevermore. Don't let anyone tell you that that healing stuff, those miracles were just in the past. No, we were singing it right now, weren't we? That he does miracles so great. He does them. Not he did them. He does miracles so great. Hallelujah. Praise God. We thank God for that wonderful praise report. And uh, also in the newsletter, you'll see, uh, let's uh, also lift up in prayer our brother Jason. He is here today. Uh, he's been working on the door as an usher today. We're so glad he's with us. Uh, but he did have a nasty fall, and uh, he, uh, he wounded his head a little bit. Um, but that looks like it's almost completely closed up when I saw him today. Uh, but he also had uh, injured his shoulder as well and done some, some injury to the muscles in his shoulder and in his arm. Um, and the doctor said it would take about a month or so to recover. But I, I, I spoke to him this morning. He said, oh, it's nearly there. You know, so praise God for that. But uh, do keep uh, Jason in your prayers as well. Praise God. So very pleased that uh, Lynn has uh, released her novel. I've got it here, The, the Hidden Enemy. Praise God. Yeah, come on. Uh, the, the novel has been, uh, I, it has been available for a while as a digital uh, copy on, uh, on Amazon, but she's, uh, she's finally uh, been able to release the print version. It's a 400-page novel, a, a murder mystery, uh, set right here in Oxford. I haven't actually read it yet, but I've got my copy now, so I'm going to get stuck into it. But it's a murder mystery set right here in Oxford and uh, dealing with, the, uh, in, in a, with a fictional story telling the real truth of spiritual warfare that happens. So uh, the, the book is available in the lobby. Lynn has plenty of copies with her today, and I'm sure she'll have them over the next few weeks as well. Uh, the Hidden Enemy, it's uh, 10 pounds. Um, for, for, from, uh, from Lynn there at the table, and she's willing to sign any copy. So if you want to get your book signed, it's always nice to have the book signed um, by, by the author. It, it reminded me that I, I saw a, a thing, uh, I don't know if anyone else saw this, but there was, there was, a, there was a sort of th a meme on the internet that showed uh, a bookshop with uh, Bibles for sale. And it had a, a, Catherine, I know you love your Christian memes, you've seen this. So there, there were these Bibles on the bookshelf, and there was the, the Bible there, and the little note underneath from the bookshop said, signed copy. <laughs> signed copy. I mean, you know, that would be the most priceless thing on earth, a signed copy of God's Word. I mean, that just that makes you think of the finger of God coming down on Mount, <laughs> on Mount Sinai, under, inscribing the tablets of stone. Praise God. Signed copy. So Lynn is, uh, is available today to assign your copies. Do get them. Do, uh, do buy, uh, buy your own copy. Ten pounds at the book table. Uh, we're so uh, so pleased that uh, it's amazing that there are so many authors, and uh, I'm aware of uh, even more books that are coming from from members of the the congregation as well. So thank God for that. Praise God. Let's see. Uh, oh, Lynn also does ask uh, for for prayer as well for her daughter. We will pray uh, for Anita, who has been through some uh, some very difficult uh, court cases um, uh, in over custody of her children and uh, the financial court cases coming up. But uh, praise God, the Lord has upheld her and, uh, and drawn Anita, I think, um, closer and back to her faith um, through all of this. But uh, do keep Anita in your prayers as she, she goes through that sort of difficult uh, period. Praise God. Next Sunday, oh, I like this one. This, is, this might just be my favorite one because it concerns food. <laughs> Next uh, Sunday... Uh, after the service uh, in the community hall opposite, there will be flapjacks for sale. So if you are a flapjack fan, there will be homemade uh, flapjacks available. And uh, this is uh, Ruth Lindsay, one of our young people who will be uh, making these and uh, selling these uh, next Sunday because she's raising funds for a Christian camp that she will be attending later, I believe it's in the summer. Uh, the camp is called Contagious, and uh, it's a camp that empowers young people to be passionate about the Word of God, passionate about sharing the gospel uh, with young people uh, in their peer groups, and, uh, and uh, make a, make a giving a good opportunity for them to forge friendships with others, people from other backgrounds, other places, and uh, just uh, build them in their faith. So, so uh, I believe also that they, uh, the camp uh, raises uh, money uh, to help other children from from uh, less fortunate backgrounds who maybe couldn't afford the cost of the camp, uh, those funds raised to help those other children to pay for the camp as well. So uh, do support Ruth in that next Sunday after the morning service, flapjacks for sale. Just get behind me in the queue 
and uh, and uh, let's uh, let's do our bit to support Ruth as she uh, gets ready for contagious in uh, in the summer. Praise God. Right now, I believe we have a special presentation. I can see some sparkly children at the side of the hall. Do come on up, and I will turn things over to you. She's prudent, she's wise, she's elegant, and she's kind. Full of God's grace, we cherish her loving embrace. She'll light up the room with her infectious laughter. The crown of her husband, she's a blessing to our pastor. Good morning, family. I'm sure you all now know who I'm talking about. <laughs> this Tuesday, we celebrate the birthday of our dear Pastor Hillary. Babies and animals are so close to her heart, she wouldn't want them to come to any harm. The oppressed and the abused, they break her heart. A Christian warrior, she prays in the spirit. If there's a need for prayer, she wouldn't waste a minute. The OBC family, each and every one, we honor her for all she's done. For the family of God that she so dearly loves. Happy birthday, Pastor Hillary. We love you. Dear Pastor Hillary, may the Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Thank you for being such a wonderful pastor. Happy birthday. Infinite wisdom, the law surely knew that Oxford Bible Church need a pastor as faithful as you. A love of God's word and a heart for his flock. You give of yourself and you stand on the rock. For the early Sunday mornings, for the wise counsel and advice, for the patience, love and sacrifice. Thank you for always giving your all and happy birthday, Pastor Hillary. Happy birthday, Pastor Hillary. I would like to say a prayer for you. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Pastor Hillary and giving her as a leader and supporter. In Psalms 128, it says, you will eat the fruit of your labor. Blessings and prosperity will be yours. We also pray that her faith will endure forever. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, Pastor Hillary. Happy birthday, Pastor Hillary. I have some flowers for you. Have a blessed day. Dear Pastor Hillary, I hope all of our messages made you feel loved and appreciated. Please can we all stand as we pray for Pastor Hillary. Father God, I thank you for Pastor Hillary. I thank you that she is an amazing pastor and an inspiration to us all. I pray that your angels will continue to guard her and keep her safe and that you will satisfy her with long life and show her your salvation. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we all sing happy birthday to Pastor Hillary? Happy birthday.
Thank you so much, children. Come on, put your hands together for the children. Praise God. Hallelujah. Oh, it's so, it's so wonderful to see the, the Spirit of God on young children like that. I remember when I was, when I was that age, if I had to stand, I mean, you, it's, you can't believe it right now because you know what I'm like. But when I, was, when I was that age, I would have probably burst into tears if I had to stand up in front of a group like this. But uh, praise God. That's so wonderful. So just a few more announcements, just to say, of course, that we, uh, we have our prayer meeting this Thursday, 8 p.m. by Zoom. Information in the newsletter there. So uh, do join us if you can. Uh, also, uh, this Wednesday, Pastor Derek will be uh, resuming the, uh, the series in the Bible study, uh, going through the book of Psalms, and he'll be on Psalm 18. That's this Wednesday, 7.30 on the live stream, uh, 7.15 at their house, if you can make it in person. We do encourage you if you can make it in person, but uh, 7.30 on the live stream on the YouTube channel. And next Sunday, we have a very special guest, uh, Dr. Camille Majdali, who is an Arab-American, uh, raised in uh, Los Angeles uh, to Arab-American parents and uh, came to faith as a, a teenager and uh, has been for the last uh, two decades or more in, in full-time ministry, traveling uh, around the world and uh, was for a time, I think, based in uh, Australia. Um, but uh, his ministry, Teach All Nations, uh, travels the world preaching the Word of God uh, with a particular emphasis on, uh, on Bible prophecy, the fulfillment of prophecy, the need to be ready for the coming of the Lord. And in fact, his, his message ne next week is uh, Jesus is coming soon. So uh, you don't want to miss that. Uh, so do, uh, do uh, be ready for that next Sunday. That's Dr. Camille. And of course, we have uh, the evening service uh, each Sunday, 6 p.m. in the community hall opposite. We'd love to see you if you can join us uh, for that. And uh, we, it's always a, a blessed time. Praise God. Well, let's come to a, a time of prayer, and as we do, worship team, if you want to get ready. And uh, I already mentioned, of course, we have the offering bucket uh, by the door. We're so grateful for all the tithes and the offerings and the donations that come in, and uh, those who give online, uh, we're so grateful for, for all of you and your faithful giving. It enables us to do everything that we do, and uh, you can just go to our website if you're unsure of the ways to give, uh, all the information is on our website, oxfordbiblechurch.co.uk. Uh, just hit the donate tab and uh, you'll see all that information there. Praise God. Let's pray. Father, we, first of all, Lord, just want to thank you again so much for what you've done in Martha Biffer and raising her up again. And Lord, we're so grateful for, for your strength in her right now, making her body strong so that she can run and play with all the vigor that she has done in the past. And we just thank you, Lord, for, for this miracle in her body. And Father, we remember all those who need your healing touch, Lord. We thank you for speedy recovery for Jason in his shoulder and arm. We just speak to that arm right now in the name of Jesus and say, be healed. Muscles be healed. Shoulder be healed. Bones and ligaments be healed right now in the name of Jesus Christ. Be strong as God intended in the name of the Lord Jesus. And thank you, Lord, for, for just bringing him to full recovery and enabling him to go back to work soon. Sooner than the doctor said, Lord. We believe your report. We know they are doing the best that they can according to their knowledge. But we believe your report, Lord. And we declare that Jason is healed in the name of Jesus Christ. And Lord, we remember our friends in Shekinah, Pakistan, who emailed asking for prayer. Because Dr. Tahira Salim and some of the others in the family have been suffering from high fever and chest infection. Lord, we just thank you that, that healing is theirs. Healing is the children's bread. And we just believe that by your stripes, they are healed. So we Amen. declare healing over them in the name of Jesus and yes. command all chest infections to be removed yes. in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. God, that lungs would be open, that airways would be open, yes. that breathing would be normal in the name of Jesus, that the fever would come down in the name of Jesus. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for that temperature becoming normal. In the name of Jesus, thank you, Lord. Thank you for it. And Father, we, we do remember, of course, all those right now who are suffering in Turkey and Syria. And we just ask, Lord, have compassion on them. Have mercy upon them, O God. And, and may the gospel reach those in that place who are distraught and suffering now. Comfort them, Lord, by your spirit, by the truth of your word going into that place. And Father, we just ask that, that you would... Enable, because I, I was reading that even though the earthquake happened on Monday, there were still, even as late as Friday, buildings coming down 
from aftershocks and people being buried afresh, people who thought they had avoided and escaped being buried. Lord, we just ask that anyone buried anywhere within that earthquake zone, anyone who was buried and still alive, that you would bring rescue workers to them, oh God, that you would just connect them, just draw those rescue workers by, with your holy angels, by your spirit, just lead them to those who are trapped and enable them to be rescued. Father, we just thank you that all the, all the aid, all the money, all the resources, all the food, all the shelter, everything that is needful, Lord, please enable every avenue and every route into that place, into those places, particularly Syria. We hear all about the aid going into Turkey. It's much more difficult in Syria because of the war. But Lord, help those people there. Enable the aid to reach those people who need it, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And Father, we just pray for Anita, Lynn's daughter, and just ask God that you would just be with her at this time and draw her nearer to you. Give her your strength, your wisdom. Enable her to prepare for this court case that she is going through with the finances, Lord. Just enable her to, to present her case clearly and fully, Lord. And may any wrongdoing or falsehood on the other side be exposed. In the name of Jesus, Abraham said, will not the God, the God of all the earth, the judge of all the earth, do right? And we, we know that you are the judge of the all, all the earth, and you will do right. And so you love justice, Lord, and we just call forth for justice in this court case, O oh God, that you would be glorified in it. That Anita would just have that peace of knowing that you are, you are with her and fighting for it in this, in the name of Jesus. We thank you for it. We thank you for it. And Father, I... We just pray again for this nation. Lord, all the turmoil, all the upheaval. God, in the, in the Church of England that doesn't seem to know what it's doing. Oh, God, we just pray. Have mercy. Have mercy. Have mercy. Were we Sodom and Gomorrah, it, the fire would have fallen a long time ago. Were you to deal with us as you dealt with them, the, the cinders would still be smoking right now. But, Lord, we thank you. And just ask that you would show mercy in this nation, oh God. Have mercy and pour out your spirit in your church and let those in the Anglican church who are being dragged along against their will in these things from the, the leadership of that church, let them stand firm for you, uncompromised in the name of Jesus. Lord, we just pray for, for our government, oh God, that you would raise up righteous government. Lord, that you would just come down and as it were, sort out the mess. Lord, we need you in this nation. We can't fix this ourselves, oh God, but we need you, Jesus, to come down in great power in this nation. We call upon you, Lord. Oh God, to pour out your spirit in this nation, for revival in this nation, for a turning back to God in this nation, against the rising tide of evil, in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness. And Lord, may you receive all the gifts that come in today, every tithe, every offering. Every donation, Lord, and may you bless it and use it for the extension of the borders of your kingdom, for the increase of your fame and glory around the world, Lord, that the, the gospel would go forth through Oxford Bible Church. And may you bless all those who give today in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand. Celebrate the love. 
Praise God. It's time to release the children and the youth. Praise God. Let them have a blessed time right now. In Jesus' name, praise God. Praise God. Wonderful. Well, I've been looking forward to sharing a message on the day of the Lord, but um, it kept getting postponed, and I realize why now, that I wasn't quite ready to give it. And... Uh, the day of the Lord, I believe it might sound like, oh, something very abstract, but it's very relevant for our lives right now and how we live. It's actually a big theme of Bible prophecy, but sadly, as a whole, the church has a weak understanding of this subject, and um, it's kind of seen as uh, not really relevant to our daily lives. But uh, let me introduce this this word, the day of the Lord, it comes up very, in fact, it's used 15 times in the Old Testament, and the New Testament has a lot to say about it as well. Um, it has a dual meaning in Scripture. The, the meaning generally of the day of the Lord is when God directly intervenes in human history. Of course, we know through providence God is involved all the time. But this is on a different scale. This is where God will personally intervene. And um, there's a dual meaning to the day of the Lord, just like all our days are made of two parts. Biblically, actually, the day starts in the evening, at sun, sunset. And so the first part is the evening and the night. And then it's followed by the light of the morning, of the new daytime. And so in the same way, the day of the Lord has two aspects, a time of darkness and a time of light. The time of light is actually when Christ will reign on the earth directly, personally, rule and reign on the earth for a thousand years. And it's interesting that 2 Peter 3.8 says that the, a day to the Lord is as a thousand years. And I believe that actually all of time since Adam has been on God's clock of seven days, 
which is 7,000 years. And for the first four days takes you, the first 4,000 years takes you up to Christ. And a picture of that is that the Lamb of God, a lamb, the Passover lamb rather, was set aside four days before it was actually crucified. In the same way Christ was set aside to be crucified 4,000 years before he was actually crucified. And Jesus' death and resurrection brought in a new day of history. And there are 2,000 years. The implication is there are 2,000 years. And then at the end of the sixth day, God is going to bring in the day of the Lord in terms of his kingdom on the earth. The, he will reign on earth for a 1,000 years. And that was what the Jews believed. That's what the early Christians believed. That's what John confirmed in the book of Revelation when he made it clear that the future golden age, when Christ himself will rule on the earth, and by the way, you will rule and reign with him in your glorified bodies for a thousand years. And so that's, that's the positive day of the Lord, if you like. But the Bible's also clear that before this time of light, when the glory of the Lord will cover the earth, that God, uh, will, God will have to prepare the way for this time of light by the other aspect of the day of the Lord, which is compared to the night, to a time of darkness. And we call this also the tribulation. And normally the references in the Bible to the day of the Lord are actually mostly talking about this, t this time of darkness. That, that God uses to prepare the way for the time of light. And uh, because, you see, he, if he is going to reign over the earth, then that means he f has to, first of all, judge and dismantle all the kingdoms of man, all the kingdoms of this world, before he can establish his kingdom on earth. And that requires this time called the tribulation. But first of all, let me show you a prophecy that indicates uh, this 2,000 years, followed by the 1,000 years of Christ reigning on earth. It's in Hosea 5.14. This is one of my favorite prophecies. It describes the first coming of the Messiah to Israel, but it results in judgment coming on Israel because Israel rejected her Messiah. And, he, and the Messiah is speaking in verse Hosea 5.14, he says, I will be like a lion to Ephraim and like a young lion to the house of Judah. Christ, Jesus is the lion of Ju the from the tribe of Judah. And then he says, I, even I, and it's actually the Lord speaking, will tear them and go away. I will take them away and no one shall rescue. And this speaks of judgment coming on Israel. And the judgment that came on Israel Soon after Christ's resurrection, when she was scattered to the nations, that was because of her rejection of the Messiah. And then he says, uh, I, this is verse 15 now, I, the Messiah, will return again to my place. This predicts his ascension back to heaven. Until, notice, it, God has not finished with Israel. Until, he'll stay in heaven until... They, that's Israel, acknowledge their offense, that is their rejection of Christ. And then they will seek my face. This predicts the repentance of Israel in the future. And in their affliction, they will earnestly seek me. And Israel's repentance is going to happen in the tribulation, in this time called the day of the Lord. It's also called the day of Jacob's trouble. And then Hosea chapter 6 continues the prophecy and it describes the leaders of Israel calling Israel back to the Lord. And they say it like this, after two days, he will revive us. And there's a hint that after 2,000 years of Israel's rejection of Christ, and you don't have to be great at maths to realize we are getting close to the end of 2,000 years from Christ. After two days, he will revive us. Israel will be restored. And on the third day, notice, there's another day after these two days. On the third day, he will raise us up that we may live in his sight. 
and Israel will be restored and will live in the sight of the Lord on that third day, which is, we call it the millennium. Praise God. The, the, the ultimate day of the Lord. Praise God. So if that's true, um, then that is, you know, telling us that time is short. And so it's, I wanted to emphasize the light part of the day of the Lord when Christ will reign over the earth because that's the main thing in a way. But today we're going to focus on the darkness phase of the day of the Lord, which necessarily comes first. Because the purpose of the dark phase is to prepare the way for the light phase, for the kingdom of God on the earth. God must first bring an end to the reign of fallen man in order for God's kingdom to be established. He must render righteous judgment on the kingdoms of the world and bring them to their end. And I'm going to focus on this, actually, because that's what's happening next. And we need to be ready because the Bible is clear that the day of the Lord will suddenly come upon the earth and will take the world by surprise. And <coughs> we need to be ready for this. In fact, I've been writing a new book over the last uh, year or so, and, uh, which, I'm prob which is about the day of the Lord and the rapture. I'm, I'm calling it dual imminence because it, it came to me uh, clearly, having studied this, that throughout the, throughout the New Testament is this teaching that the day of the Lord is imminent. It can happen at any time. And also, the rapture is imminent when Christ is coming for his church. That's imminent too. How can they both be imminent? Only because they're simultaneous. In other words, at any moment, Christ is coming for us in the rapture, and on the same day, he's going to initiate the day of the Lord on the earth. Anyway, I'll, I'll explain that in 150 pages. Um, <laughs> but that's coming, that will come out soon. But um, let me talk about this day of the Lord, because it's throughout the Bible. The prophets saw a future time of worldwide judgment called the day of the Lord at the end of the age. Just before the Messiah comes to establish his glorious kingdom on the earth. It's a time of darkness and judgment on Israel as well as on the nations. And uh, Amos 5 is one of the early references to this because a lot of the Israelites were thinking, you know, it's going to be a time, well, it may be darkness on the Gentiles, but we'll be fine. But actually, Amos 5.18 is a classic verse on this, verse 18 to 20. Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. For what end is it for you? The day of the Lord is darkness and not light. It'll be as though a man fled from a lion and a bear hit, met him. Or as though he went into the house, leaned his hand on the wall and a serpent bit him. Shall not the day of the Lord be darkness and not light, even very dark and no brightness in it? People are, you know, I'm sorry that this is a serious sermon today, that actually if you are invested in this world, I'm sorry, God's going to intervene in history and he is going to judge this world. Normal life will not be resuming and we're getting very close to that. And, and you might think, well, I, that doesn't seem like, you know, um, this is about to happen. Well, I'll address that in a minute. In fact, the signs are there, very clear, that we are heading towards the end game. But anyway, this concept is throughout the prophetic writings, and it describes a whole series of events. And of course, the book of Revelation gives the most detailed description of what will take place. And I take that literally, in the day of the Lord. And so there is a time of judgment, a time of worldwide judgment coming on this earth. Let me quickly just summarize the same, the three main purposes for the tribulation. Number one, it's to end wickedness and wicked ones. Evil will be allowed to come to its fullness so that God can judge it. And it is worldwide judgment. Isaiah 13, 9 says, Behold, the day of the Lord comes. Cruel with both wrath and fierce anger. It's divine wrath coming on the earth. To lay the earth desolate 
and he will destroy its sinners from it. By the end of the day of the Lord, all those who have not repented and turned to God will, will, will be dead. The earth will be depopulated. People often ask, well, why does God allow evil to go on? Well, the Bible actually says he won't. He is going to put an end to all the sin that's taking place on the earth. He's long-suffering, but one day it's going to be judgment time. And that's the day of the Lord. This is when God's kingdom comes into direct conf confrontation with the kingdoms of this world. You see, for 2,000 years almost, God has been offering the gospel, a reconciliation for men to be forgiven and to be saved. But there's a, a time limit on that before God is going to move in judgment. The second purpose of the tribulation is a worldwide soul harvest. So even while the judgments are happening, God will be calling sinners to repentance, and many will be saved in the tribulation. Praise God. The third purpose of the tribulation is the salvation of Israel. So the day of the Lord is a future time of God's decisive intervention into human history. And um, God has done judgments in history. They're the rise and fall of nations is, of, is very much the, involves God's judgments on nations as they uh, come under judgment. But the day of the Lord is on a different level altogether. This is where God moves in a worldwide judgment, judges all the nations at the same time. And um, this is God waging war on the kingdoms of this world. And let me make it clear that there are two kinds of judgment. There is the eternal judgment of God upon every person. And, and that's including all of us. The moment a person steps out of their body and leaves this life, leaves the scene of history, if you like, and at their death, they enter into uh, a judgment before God. And their individual, you will be, have to give an account to God. And at death, you either go up to heaven or you go down. You either die in Christ or in your sins. And then at your resurrection, you will, men will be released into their eternal state, either of glory or of the lake of fire. And that's the eternal judgment that happens outside the realm of history on earth that happens when you enter into, when you leave this life. The other judgments are God's judgments in history. And God does intervene in history. But the day of the Lord is the greatest ever judgment of God in history. God is going to dramatically change the course of human history in a short time, just a few years. And there is only one event that is comparable to it uh, from the past, and that's Noah's flood. That's a, it was a global judgment, total judgment, total God, as it were, wiping out the whole of uh, human society and then starting again with Noah. And that's exactly what's going to happen with the day of the Lord. And God is going to then set up his new kingdom on earth. And, and so this is a major event. This is a mega event, you, you might say. And it's a worldwide judgment. Let's see Isaiah. Isaiah 2.12 says, For the day of the Lord of hosts shall be upon every one that is proud and lofty. Have you humbled yourself before God? Or are you your own God? Do you make up your own rules? Or are you submitted to God? It's not wise to be proud and lofty. And upon everyone that is lifted up, he shall be brought low. Isaiah 13 verse 6. Howl, for the day of the Lord is at hand. It could come upon the earth at any time. It shall come as destruction from the Almighty. 
And Obadiah 1.15 could well be the very first mention of the day of the Lord. It's a classic verse, Obadiah 1.15. The day of the Lord is near upon all nations. It's a worldwide judgment. And this is the principle of the judgment. We'll come back to this later. As you have done, so it will be done to you. Your reward shall return upon your own head. How you have treated others, how nations have treated the people in them and, and others, that's going to return upon them. That's the key principle that we'll see in a bit. Now, a classic, um, in fact, Isaiah 24 to 27 is the Old Testament apocalypse. It's the equivalent of the book of Revelation, you might say. And Isaiah 24 is a, we're going to read a few verses. It describes the devastation of the whole earth and the total depopulation of the earth. And again, don't blame me for being negative, all right? I'm just, my job is to just tell you what the Bible teaches, all right? And, and it doesn't matter whether you like it or not. It's the truth, all right? So just get in line with the truth. <laughs> this is going to happen. And the indications of the Bible is it's going to happen in our lifetime. Okay? I won't prove that to you, but the Bible's pretty clear on that point. Again, verse 1. Behold, the Lord makes the earth empty, and he makes it waste. He distorts its surface. This is from the judgments described in the book of Revelation. And he scatters abroad its inhabitants. And it shall be as with the people, so with the priest. As with the servant, so with his master. In other words, it's not the kind of thing where the rich people can escape to the Bahamas or somewhere and they're okay. There is no escape. It's everywhere and it affects everyone. The servant, the master, as with the maid, so with her mistress, as with the buyer, so the seller, as with the lender, so the borrower, as the creditor, so the debtor. And then it says, verse 3, the land or the earth, is the same word, the earth shall be completely, entirely emptied and utterly plundered, for the Lord has spoken this word. If there are, is it nine billion people on the earth right now, by the end of the day of the Lord, it, it will be lucky if there are one billion left. It's, it's of that level. And so the earth will be depopulated. For the Lord has spoken this word. Verse 4. The earth mourns and fades away. The world languishes and fades away. The haughty people of the earth languish. They are haughty. Not because they're kind of certain snobbish people. It's talking about human pride. That if we don't turn to God, c controls all of us. It's me, me, me. It's all about me. I'm my own God. It's selfism. The very spirit of our culture is pride. I don't need God. I'll just do my own thing. God's irrelevant. That is the essence of pride. And then he, verse 5 and 6 are the key verses I want to focus on. For the earth is also defiled under its inhabitants. It's man's sin, and it's nine billion people, as it were, sinning that defiles the earth and brings the curse on the earth. It says, because they have transgressed the laws, the laws of God, changed the ordinance of God, and broken the everlasting covenant. And I already want to major on this verse with Preparing for this, I felt the Lord showed me a few things as to what, what brings this kind of massive judgment upon the earth. And broken the everlasting covenant. Therefore, the curse has devoured the earth. And those who dwell in it are desolate. It's, you see, it's sin that causes the curse on the earth and the earthquakes and all the rest of it. It's man's sin creates a... Because the natural and spiritual things are connected. And sin brings curse. And curse disrupts the natural order. You think sin, you can sin and get away with it, but you can't. Because sin is automatically attached to curse. If you don't repent of that sin, 
that will bring a disruption on your whole life. Things will not work out the way they should because there, there's an activated curse in your life. That's why you should keep short accounts with God. Repent quickly. Put it under the blood of Jesus because sin brings curse. It's a law. And there is a massive curse, spiritual curse at work in the earth because of the massive sin that has been going on. And that is a big cause of the judgments of the day of the Lord. And it says, those who dwell in it are desolate. Therefore, the inhabitants of the earth are burned and few men are left by the end of the day of the Lord. And notice, it's, this is not caused by the second coming of Christ. All right? It's caused by the, the curse that will be fully released. Right now, by the grace of God, especially shed by the blood of Jesus, there is mercy upon the world. God is withholding his judgment on the basis of the blood of Christ. He's holding it back. And, and therefore, but one day, he will take his hands off, as it were, and allow the full curse to be manifested in the earth. And uh, the world has been saying, God, we don't want you. God says, okay, have it your way. And then um, let me jump to verse 18. It finishes by saying, For the windows from on high are open, and the foundations of the earth are shaken. There will be earthquakes in the day of the Lord that even the latest earthquake it will be as nothing compared to what is coming in the day of the Lord. It says, verse 19, the earth is violently broken. The earth is split open. The earth is shaken exceedingly. The earth, verse 20, shall reel to and fro like a drunkard and shall totter like a hut. Why? Its transgression shall be heavy upon it. And so I want you to notice here, and I just want to share with you what I think God's saying here by in verse, I think it's in verse 5, that the, the cause is the breaking of the everlasting covenant. Now, there are two ways to interpret that, and I believe they're both true. The first interpretation, what is the everlasting covenant, is actually the covenant that God made with Noah. That is the, uh, the first very clear-cut covenant in the Bible. God made through Noah, with all mankind, because we're all of us descended from Noah, by the way. Okay, as well as Adam, we're all descended from Noah. And when God made a covenant with Noah, he made it with the whole of mankind. And um, that was a covenant that's still in place now and will continue to the end of time. In that case, in that way, it's everlasting. That's one way the Hebrew word olam, everlasting, means to the end of time. Um, and let's talk about this. So this, again, connects us with Noah and the flood of Noah um, and the covenant that then came on the earth as a result. What was the cause of Noah's flood? That's the only precedent we have in Scripture is Noah's flood. The cause of Noah's flood was the shedding of innocent blood, and that, that brings the curse on the earth. That is the ultimate sin that man can commit against man, is, is murder, the shedding of innocent blood. Genesis 6.13, God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence. So the, the immediate cause God refers to is violence, the shedding of blood. The earth is not just, is filled with violence. Uh, and it says, through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. In other words, because they have shed innocent blood, so they are going to reap what they've sown. And so many sins bring judgment, but especially the sin of blood, of murder. And, and we see the first murder in the Bible in Genesis 4.10, of course, when Cain killed Abel. Because, and often it's the wicked killing the righteous in particular. And as this is an example of, he, Cain killed Abel because he was in rebellion against God. And, and uh, Abel was serving God. 
Genesis 4.10, God says, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. And so Abel's blood actually was shed on the earth. And now that blood is crying out for vengeance. That means that, that there's a curse now on the murderer because of that innocent blood which cries out for vengeance righteously. So now, he says, verse 11, you are cursed from the earth. That, that shedding of innocent blood brings a curse. And it says, in this case, on Cain, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. So the, every sin brings a curse, but the big one is the shedding of innocent blood. And then God, <coughs> sorry, God made an everlasting covenant with man through Noah. And the central feature of this covenant was the institution of human government to deal with crime, but in particular to deal with the crime of murder, okay? The taking of innocent life, that is the ultimate crime. And in, and in a sense, that's the only thing that's mentioned, although from that, of course, it follows as a, you know, that other crimes should be committed, all right? Because if I don't kill you, but if I do something else that seriously harms you, then on that same principle, there should be judgment for me on that issue too. And so the whole purpose of human government is law and order. That's the first thing that any government needs to get right. And Genesis 9.5, God says, Surely for your lifeblood I will demand a reckoning. From the hand of every beast I'll require it, and from the hand of man. From the hand of every man's brother I will require the life of a man. Whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood will be shed. For in the image of God he made man. And basically, God is authorizing men to deal with that murderer. The, the function of the state is that to deal with crime, but particularly with murder, they are authorized to investigate it and to punish it. And God actually gives them the right to apply capital punishment. Okay, obviously, there needs to be a sufficiently high standard of proof for that. But that is the original ordinance that God established. And as he talks about, yeah, he changed the ordinance. They, man knows better than God. And we'll see how the nations have rejected the everlasting covenant that God instituted through Noah. And so God empowered nations to do this and nations are accountable to God to carry out this judgment of those who do evil in a righteous way. If they don't, then the whole nation is guilty of that innocent blood. Not just the murderer, but the curse comes on the whole nation. And, and we see that in Deuteronomy 21-22, because this is actually... An interesting verse that is quoted in Galatians 3, but Deuteronomy 21, 22. If a man has committed a sin deserving of death, in other words, murder, and he is put to death and you hang him on a tree, his body will not remain overnight on the tree, but you will surely bury him that day so that you do not defile the land which the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance, for he who hanged is accursed of God. And what it's basically saying is, this man, through this murder, has, has actually under a curse. And if, if that is not dealt with properly, and the way that he should be dealt with is by capital punishment, and then his body would be buried, and then the curse will be put away. If, however, that um, justice has not been done, then the blood of that murdered person is still crying out from the ground. And the curse is still on that nation because they have not dealt with that, which they have been called to do. And so 
a curse comes on the nations through the shedding of innocent blood. All right. And, and that's what Isaiah is talking about. They have broken the everlasting covenant. How have the nations broken it? Well, you can't stop people murdering. And the, and the state is required to do its best to, to punish the evildoers. But the ultimate sin of a state, I put it to you, and this is the impression I got, is when the state violates this everlasting covenant by and even reverses the reason for their existence, for the state's existence. What is the purpose of the state? Number one, to protect the innocent from murder. So the ultimate sin of a state is state-sanctioned murder. And that happens in two ways that I can see. Number one, what often happens in states in history uh, is that there is a state religion. And the, usually it's the saints who are persecuted for their faith. And so you'll see in many countries around the world in areas where a certain religion dominates the state, and as in a way there's no separation of state from that religion, then that religion, and there has been Christian forms of this down history, all right, that religion, whether it's Hinduism, Islam, you know, um, all kinds, there is state-sanctioned persecution and even murder. And that is... Uh, emphasized in the Bible as something that will bring judgment on that nation. God, if he sees his saints being persecuted and especially being murdered for their faith or for righteousness, God takes that very seriously. In fact, Revelation 17.5 talks about Babylon, which is, let's just say, it's the final, it's the world system that, it, that is operating uh, in, in an evil way. Talk, talks about mystery, Babylon the Great. And in verse 6, describes this as, as a harlot, as a woman, an evil woman. And she is drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. That's her primary sin. In other words, anyone that doesn't agree with her, chop. Chapter 18, Revelation 18, 24, describing the judgment on Babylon. And in her was found the blood of the prophets and saints and of all who were slain on the earth. We, we've, we live in a blessed place right now, although there's dangers of that changing, whereby we've had freedom of our religion. But in many places of the world and many times in history, there is no such freedom. And uh, you, you stay true to your faith. You may have to lay down your life. And, and around the world, that is a great thing. But the second form of this is what's been happening, especially in these end times, which is the, the murdering of the unborn in the world. The most innocent and vulnerable of all people are... It's not... It's, it's, the, it's not that abortion has not happened in the past, but now it is state-sanctioned and state-promoted on an industrial scale. And this is the, a serious breaking of the everlasting covenant of Noah, which instituted the state to protect in, innocent life. And now the state is 100% behind the killing of these innocents on an industrial scale. scale. And not in every country of the world, but in the vast majority of the countries of the world. There are, in particular, some countries in Africa, I think Brazil as well, but the vast majority of the countries of the world are guilty before God in this area. And especially since the 60s, when abortion was industrialized. And this is actually the very reason why Israel was judged. The first judgment that came on Israel through uh, Babylon 
600 BC was for this very cause. Um, let me read the Jeremiah. Oh, I've lost the chapter reference here. Okay, well, this is a chapter in Jeremiah. <laughs> all right. Um, all right. It's, it's an, start looking. It's, it's like anywhere from 20 onwards. All right. If anyone finds it, um, shout it out. Thus says the Lord, go get a potter's earthen flask. And take some of the elders of the people and some of the elders of the priests and go out to the valley of the son of Hinnom. This is the lowest part of Jerusalem, on the, the valley on the south side, which is by the entry of the potsherd gate. And proclaim there the words that I will tell you and say, verse 3, Hear the word of the Lord, O kings of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem. Has anyone found it yet? 19. Thank you. All right. Hear the word of the Lord. This is Jeremiah. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will bring such a catastrophe on this place, that whoever hears of it, his ears will tingle. Verse 4. Because they've forsaken me and made this an alien place, because they've burnt incense in it to the other gods, which they, their fathers, nor the kings of Judah have known, and have filled this place with the blood of innocence. Now what was happening is that in the south of Jerusalem, just south of the city wall, in this valley, the Valley of Hinnom, that uh, we'll see Jesus refers to, they were sacrificing their children to Baal and, and to Molech, these false gods, and burning them in, in, in a fire. And I won't go into the details of it. And blowing trumpets to drown out the cries of these young babies who were being sacrificed for prosperity, for 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 their materialistic, you know, to please the gods so that they'll make them prosperous. And God, that, that made God angry. And he particularly points to this sin as the reason why judgment is now going to come on Israel. It wasn't just that odd, ran, eccentric individuals were doing this. This was coming from the top. This is what the king was doing. And this is what, it was state-sanctioned. Murder of the infants. And he says, because they have forsaken me. No, I said that. Verse 5. They have built the high places of Baal to burn their sons with fire for burnt offerings to Baal, which I did not command or speak. Neither did it come into my mind. Verse 6. Therefore the days are coming that this place will no longer be called Tophet or the valley of the son of Hinnom, but the valley of slaughter, because the Israelites will be slaughtered by the Babylonians. And be buried in that valley. And in other words, what you do to others is going to come on you. If you are going to sanction mass murder, you have got a terrible judgment coming upon you. And this then became known as a place. He said, this is no longer going to be a place of sacrifice. This is going to be a place of judgment. And this is where we, Jesus talks about hell as he names hell after this place. The valley of Hinnom into the Greek becomes Gehenna, which is the word for the lake of fire. In other words, this becomes symbolized. God is saying, if you do this, this will be your end. Destruction in Gehenna. And so we might ask, since such sin has been going on on the earth, why is God not judged already? Why has he extended so much mercy? Well, remember that verse in Deuteronomy, which was God's prescription as to how that curse would not come on the earth, on the land. It was by someone being punished for that sin and being put up on a tree. And then through that, they would remove the curse from the land and take the curse on themselves so that the land would be under the blessing rather than the curse. And this is taken up in Galatians 3.13. Christ has redeemed us from the curse, praise God, having become a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on us. Hallelujah. In other words, the only reason that judgment hasn't fallen already is because Christ has taken the curse 
And through his death on the cross and through his blood, he has, as it were, extended great mercy and grace to all the nations and sent out the gospel to all the nations that men might be saved. And that has bought us, as it were, a, t- a time of mercy and grace. And, and a similar thing is in Hebrews 12, 24. In other words, it's the blood of Jesus that has held back this curse thus far. And in Hebrews 12, it says that we have come to Mount Zion, verse 22, the city of God. And then it describes the people in heaven. And then in verse 24... Hebrews 12, 24, it says, And to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, the everlasting covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. So on on one hand, you've got all the blood of the innocent speaking out, calling for vengeance, like that represented by Abel. But you've got another blood speaking out, Mercy, mercy, mercy. Praise God. And (coughs) in the end, of course, it it matters as to whether you accept the blood of Jesus for you or, or not. But Jesus took the curse to give us mercy. He established the everlasting covenant in his blood. And now we go back to the second meaning of this everlasting covenant. The reason for the day of the Lord is the breaking of the everlasting covenant. One way we do that, the nations do that, is the killing of innocent life. Rather than protecting innocent life, the state takes innocent life. Either the persecution of the righteous or the other main way, of course, is killing the unborn. But um, the other everlasting covenant, of course, is the new covenant in the blood of Jesus. And for 2,000 years, the gospel has been preached to this world. And nevertheless, the nations as a whole have rejected God, have rejected the New Testament, New Covenant. We're even aware of this, even in the West, where the West originally embraced the gospel, but now is rejecting it. And... Of course, there are nations where the gospel is stronger and, or not, but gen, we're talking about generally across the world. Look at the United Nations and look at all of this. The world as a whole has rejected the gospel. That is a huge sin, to reject the blood of Christ, to trample on the blood of Christ as if it's nothing, and to think that man has the answer. That's a big sin. And so the twofold basis of the day of the Lord is, first of all, the world has rejected Christ. They have rejected the everlasting covenant through the blood of Christ. They've substituted it with their own religions and their own efforts. And secondly, what that means is because they've rejected the blood, they've rejected the mercy of God, which means they're also guilty and they're also still under the curse that comes on these nations for the shedding of innocent blood, the breaking of Noah's everlasting covenant. And because they've done this, as Obadiah 1.15 says, the day of the Lord is upon, near upon all the nations, because as you have done, so it will be done to you. They have shed innocent blood, and therefore their blood is going to be shed on a massive scale in the day of the Lord. But God will be preaching the gospel in the tribulation and there will be opportunities for people to repent and be saved. Okay, so that, I believe, is the spiritual dynamics at work behind all of this. And, but we need to go on to quickly <coughs> talk about um, the fact that the New Testament talks about this. In fact, Jesus, in fact, let me talk about what Jesus said. In, he describes the tribulation, the start of the tribulation, in Matthew 24, verse 7 and 8, as in terms of world wars, famines, 
pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All of these are the beginning of sorrows. And that word sorrow is birth pains. So he describes the, the effect of the curse as birth pains. And we know from Genesis that when Adam and Eve originally sinned, the curse was manifested. One of the ways it was manifested was the birth pains, which I'm afraid the women suffer, suffer from in the giving of birth. So birth pains represent the curse that came from... Thank you, Adam. You know. Now... <laughs> Here it says, in the same way, just in the same way that birth pains suddenly start and they will continue and escalate until the wonderful baby is born. So things will seem fairly normal and then suddenly these judgments are going to be released like birth pains. God's going to withhold, remove his mercy as it were and the Birth pains will erupt, and these birth pains are not just a pandemic like we've had. He says all these things will happen at the same time. There will be worldwide earthquakes. There will be worldwide pestilences, pandemics. There will be worldwide um, uh, famines. All at the same time, breaking out suddenly. And that will just be the beginning and then there will be later judgments, the trumpet judgments, the bowl judgments. It will just get worse and worse and worse until the, the wonderful baby is born, as it were, until, when Christ comes in power and glory and establishes his kingdom on the earth. But it's so bad that Jesus said in Matthew twenty four twenty two, unless those days are shortened by his coming, no flesh will be saved. All right. Now, Jesus... You might, we might think that this, you know, I, I'm, I'm really pushing this because I realize there is natural unbelief. We, from the moment we were born, we have lived in a world that has its ups and downs, but basically we can get around our normal life. You know, things upset us, but basically we, we can live our life. And so the tendency is to think, Derek, what you're talking about is unreal, it, you know. It'll never actually happen. I'm just going to live out my life and that will be that. And what you're talking about, you know, you know, it, it, it goes against the evidence of our lives. And that's exactly what um, he said in 2 Peter chapter 3. If I can just summarize verse 3 to 6. He said, in the last days there'll be scoffers. I know you're not a scoffer, but saying, you know, things are just carried on from creation. Things will just carry on the same forever. God will never do this. And he says, no, you're willfully ignorant because God has done it in the past. He, in Noah's flood, he judged the whole world. He wiped out society and started again. And he's saying, he's, he did it before, he's going to do it again. And then in verse 10, he says, the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. Just when you're not expecting it, it'll come. And you will find yourself in the day of the Lord. And Peter, uh, Jesus said it this way in Matthew 24, verse 36 to 39. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels, but my father only. But as the days of Noah were, yes, the same cause. The shedding of innocent blood. So will the coming of the Son of Man be. Jesus is going to come to take his true believers home. How am I doing? All right. He's going to come for us in the rapture. I believe that. If you are 100% for Jesus, you trust in Jesus, you're a disciple of Jesus, you are not going to come under those judgments. Because you have been saved from judgment. Because you've trusted in the blood of Jesus. And so he is coming to take you to be with him in the rapture. And then he's going to release those judgments on the earth. And he says, it's like in the days of Noah. For verse 38, as in the days before the flood, eating and drinking, marrying, giving in marriage. People going around their normal life, they think this is how it will always be. 
until the day that Noah entered the ark. Notice, the key moment was that the believers went into the ark. And we will enter into Christ. We're already in Christ spiritually, but in that day our bodies were transformed and our, even our bodies will enter into Christ. He is the ark of our salvation. Hallelujah. And we will be raptured and we will enter into his presence, safe from those judgments. Hallelujah. And it says that on that very same day, they did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So shall the coming of the Son of Man be. In other words, it will come out of nowhere when the world least expects it. A worldwide judgment is going to come on the earth. But the believers will be saved from it. Hallelujah. And then it describes the rapture in verse 40. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken in the rapture and the other left. And so on. Verse 42. Watch therefore. As believers, we should be watching and ready for this moment. Watch, therefore, if you don't know, know what hour your Lord is coming. And then he describes it to the coming of a thief. And verse 44 says, the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. So if you've got your little calculations that Jesus couldn't possibly come for another 20 years, he's going to come when you don't expect him. He, he is not going to work according to your program. And um, Paul says the same thing in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 2. He says, you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night. Jesus is coming as a thief in the night to take the precious things from the earth. You, if you belong to him, you are among those precious jewels. He's coming to take you out of the house. Hallelujah. And, but the world will wake up and discover billion, hopefully, at least a billion people missing. And he, then he, he describes the suddenness of it. Verse 3, for when they say, when they say, the world says, peace and safety, everything's fine. You know, we just got through this economic crisis. Everything seems to be going all right. Then sudden destruction, ruin comes upon them as labor pains on a pregnant woman. It will happen suddenly. And it says, they shall not escape. It's a worldwide judgment. You can't fly to Canada, get away from it. It's everywhere. And then it, he goes on and says, verse 9, that God has not appointed us to the wrath of God if we've put our trust in the blood of Jesus. So how shall we then live in the light of this reality? This is the key question. I would say to you that the world is going to get darker. The world is moving towards this time of darkness and tribulation and judgment. The world is going to get darker. In fact, increasingly, the world has lost its moral compass as it's thrown off faith in God. It loses its moral compass and if you are just passive, if you are just drifting along in your life, you're just drifting along in the world, the world and the darkness of the world will take, overtake you. And, and you will become like the world. And the, if you are just passive, that's what's going to happen. You, we have to make a quality decision. In other words, a decision from the heart I will serve the Lord. I will follow Christ. I will trust in Christ with all my heart. I will do things his way and not the world's way. God needs you to be off the fence because if you're off the fence, the world is going to take you along with it. And only by positively choosing to seek God's will and to follow God and obey God with all your heart are you going to be safe from being overtaken by the darkness of the world, which will only get stronger as a whole. And I believe the darkness will increase, but the true church will get brighter by comparison. Praise God. But, but we also need one another to keep it ourselves fired up for God because we live in a world that 
has an opposite spirit to the spirit of God. And you can't play games with it. You can't try and get the best of both. You have to choose. I'm for God. I like what Joshua said. Joshua 24, 15. If you, he basically said to the Israelite, if you want to follow the other gods, okay, go ahead. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And you need to be ready. In Revelation 18, God says to his people, verse 4, come out of her, my people. That's Babylon, the world system. Come out of her, my people. See, even some of God's people dabble in the world. They're compromised by the spirit of the world. They don't want to be unpopular, and so they just go along. And God says, come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins and lest you receive her plagues. For her sins have reached to heaven. And uh, he basically says, it's spiritually dangerous to... Because we live in the world, we must not let the world dominate us. The Bible says, do not be conformed to this world, Romans 12. If you're just passive, you will just gradually drink in the spirit of the world. You will become compromised and your zeal for God will diminish. And he says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. In other words, by your dedication to God, by your seeking God and God's word, we get transformed to be more and more like Jesus because we're actively pursuing him and submitting to him. And that's the choice. We're either going to put Christ first and be transformed and be free from the spirit of the world, or we will find ourselves being conformed to the darkness of this world. And so I urge you, be ready for the rapture. Be ready, because Christ is coming for you. And the Bible describes Christians in 1 Thessalonians 10. He says, Christians are those who are waiting for the, the Lord's coming, to, who will rescue us from the coming wrath. Jesus is coming to rescue us from the day of the Lord. But are we watching for him? Are we looking to him? Are we aligning our lives to the fact that he is Lord and that our future is with him, not in this world? Yes, we, we live our life in the world. We don't know when he's going to come. But where is our heart? Is it on this earth or is it in heaven? And if we, we need to make sure in our heart we have put our trust in Christ and we are living a life that shows that our faith is genuine. You know, it's not just a pretend faith. Well, yes, I believe in Jesus. If you have a genuine saving faith, you are submitted to God, and that will show in your life. In James 2, it says, someone who has faith but no works. In other words, it doesn't show in their life. Do not have a saving faith. Will that faith save them? Verse 14, no. Because faith without works is dead. It's inoperative. And therefore, he says, even the demons believe in God. If you say, well, I believe in God, that makes me okay, doesn't it? No. The demons believe in God and they tremble. But they don't have a saving faith because they're not submitted to God. They're still rebels against God in their pride. And so make sure you have given your heart to Jesus. You've surrendered yourself to Jesus. And that you, your whole heart and life is orientated to follow Jesus, to put him first. And that you don't walk to the tune of the world. Because that's a tune that leads you to judgment. So I'll leave you with these final verses here from Jesus. In Luke 21, verse 34 to 36. Take heed to yourselves lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing, with drunkenness, and the cares of this life. You're so involved in the earth, there's no time for God. And that day, the day of the Lord, come upon you unexpectedly. Verse 35, for it will come like a snare upon all who dwell on the face of the whole earth. 
that the snare is an animal trap. You, suddenly, snaps tight on you. Watch therefore, he says, and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. There is an escape in the rapture. And rather than going through all these things, you can stand in the righteousness of Christ. How can you be counted worthy? Not in your own righteousness, but by receiving Jesus Christ. And clothed in his righteousness, you are counted worthy. But that requires you to say yes to Jesus and receive him as your Lord and Savior and live a life accordingly. Hallelujah. And then you will, not, you will escape those things and you will stand before the Son of Man. Amen. Do, let's all stand if the worship team could come. Let's, I want to invite you to just rededicate yourself to God. If you've been on the fence in your heart and life and you have not been taking the requirements of God seriously in your life, you've been casual in your relationship with God, that is not appropriate. He is your God. He is your Savior. He's redeemed you by his blood. He claims your whole heart. He claims your whole life to be surrendered to him. Anything less than that is just not appropriate. Offer yourselves to God as a living sacrifice, which is your acceptable, reasonable worship. So, Lord, we present ourselves to you. And, Lord, we make that quality decision, Lord, that you are, Lord, you are first in our life. You have the first claim upon us. Lord, we want to follow you with all our heart. We want to live for you. We want to hear your voice. We want to obey you as you s reveal your will to us. Oh God, forgive us for being lukewarm. Forgive us for not putting you first. Lord, we want to be those who are ready for your return, ready for the rapture, because we are loving you and we are serving you. Oh God, we, want, we separate ourselves from the spirit of this world. We do not get our values from this world. We get our values from you. Lord, we dedicate ourselves to you, oh God. Holy Spirit, take possession of our hearts. Fill us that we would be in tune with the spirit of God and out of tune with this world. Lord, we love you. We do not love this world. We love you with all our heart. Oh, Holy Spirit, I pray that you make this dedication real for us. In the name of Jesus, amen, amen, amen. Praise God. What can wash away my sin? the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow. Sing it again. 
sing, oh precious, singing, oh precious is the You know, he is King of Kings, he is Lord of Lords. Amen. I just want to finish with this ditty. Praise God. He's he is <coughs> sorry. He is King of Kings. He is Lord of Forgive me. I haven't got the tune. The the, the note. He is King of kings, he is Lord of lords, Jesus is his name, and he sets us free. He is coming soon to take us home, hallelujah, praise the Lord. 
He is King of kings. He is Lord of lords. Jesus is his name. And he sets us free. He is coming soon to take us home. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. He is King of kings. He is Lord of lords. Jesus is his name. And he sets us free. He is coming soon to take us home. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord one more time. He is King of kings. He is Lord of lords. Jesus is his name. And he sets us free. He is coming soon to take us home. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. You're coming soon to take us home. We're looking for you. We're watching for you. We're waiting for you. We belong to you, O oh God. Thank you for saving us. Hallelujah. Thank you for taking us home. Hallelujah. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week. Bible study Wednesday, prayer meeting Thursday. God bless you. Amen.